Welcome to Vidivo Church. We've been looking forward to the new year for a very long time. We've been getting ready. We've been watching. We've been studying and preparing ourselves in order to adapt to what we know is true in the coming years ahead. Starting in the year 2017, January 1st, even at the stroke of midnight, in Jerusalem that is, we do proclaim and we say to you without any question of doubt in our mind or any possibility of there being an error in our study of scriptures that you need to prepare yourself for the coming of the Lord. Jesus is coming sooner than you think. He's right around the corner. He's knocking at your door. As a matter of fact, if you are listening, he's even saying unto you, come. I know there have been, prior to the year 2017, many, many, many people who have gone out of their way to proclaim that Jesus is coming today. Well, we're not going to do that tonight. We're going to say unto you that any time from the years 2017 through the years 2034, Jesus could come and take some away in what is called the event by us, the rapture by others, the natsal in Hebrew, the rapturos in Latin or Greek, and the snatching away in English, the rescuing of a certain amount of people that we know some of the scriptures that are used to discuss the rapture describe a certain amount of people that were watching and ready to be caught up as it were with the Lord in the air. Now not all the scriptures that you're familiar with do we agree are part of the rapture. We do believe as everyone has proclaimed and written books about that there is a what some call pre-trib rapture. That simply means that before the time of Jacob's trouble, as we say in Hebrew, before the great tribulation that is spoken of by Daniel the prophet and is written in a lot of books you've read by Jenkins and Hay and other people have proclaimed, including Hal Lindsey and Chuck Missler, as well as many others that you maybe gone to a seminar and heard about, but the Great Tribulation, Jesus said, was a certain time period that would never be like anything that had happened to the earth before or ever would happen again. That Great Tribulation period was broken up into two parts, equal parts, but the first half being a time of prosperity, a time of peace, a time of growing awareness that for the Jew, they're looking at it not quite the same way that the Gentile is. And the Gentile is looking at it quite not the same way that the rest of the world is. But some people are seeing a great Savior come unto the world scene that is not religious, but is very politically minded, very business oriented, and actually solves a lot of the issues going on in the world of the world and by the world. He doesn't actually have any real powers. He doesn't have any real miraculous events that go along with him, except eventually we recognize that sometime in the future, he does suffer a wound, being that he is either shot, somehow afflicted, but something happens where he is uh, struck down, so to speak, and quote unquote, revise. Now, this is to imitate and to be similar to that with which Jesus has done as a miracle, resurrected from the dead. The Antichrist, as we call him, the son of perdition, the man of sin, who is soon to be revealed, often imitates everything that God has prophesied, but not to the fulfillment of all the scriptures that are listed in the Bible. As a matter of fact, that's part of the message we're sharing tonight is a shadow of things to come and why or where is American prophecy. As we start this first hour, that's really where we want to focus. But that overview of the man of sin, the Antichrist that comes, there is a deviation 
and a realization. The deviant is antichrist. The realization is Christ. The false is a false Messiah figure. The reality is the actual Messiah who is coming. There is that with which was imitated as the first coming of the Antichrist, which would be similar to, oh, we could say Hitler. We could say uh, Antiochus Epiphanes when he went into the temple and he slaughtered a pig on the Holy of Holies and desecrated the temple. That's a type of the first coming of the Antichrist. It isn't the actual fulfillment, but it does a pretty good job of applying the scriptures that are true today that were true back then because he's a world leader now Hitler was a world economic leader to Germany but not to solving the world's problems and Iacchus Epiphanes who slaughtered the pig in the temple was a typology of the Antichrist to come because he didn't solve the world or bring Pax Romanus to the entire world he actually was still fighting battles and we know by the Maccabean revolt and by the Roman occupation that wasn't world peace because the Jews never were settled in that type of Pax Romanus Roman peace world peace made by Rome now being a typology or a shadow of the things to come that meant that they were a small portion of something that was going to happen again and again in successive realizations that would become more like the actual fulfillment until God brought on the scene the reality of the man of sin to be revealed. Some say he can't be revealed until the Holy Spirit is removed. Some say that the keeping back or the holding back of evil by the Spirit of God being light and that darkness could not be there prevents people from knowing who the Antichrist is or the false messianic figure or the false salvation of the world or the false political leader. That's partially true and we agree on a lot of that in studying the scriptures and what we're doing tonight in giving a update to all those things that have come true that are coming true and that have yet to be true. You see we don't come up with something new like some prophecy people have done with some kind of Islamic Mahdi who's supposed to be the type of the Antichrist that can't fulfill all the scriptures that are listed in the Bible in order to be the false man of sin because he doesn't deal with the world and bring peace. Now there have been caliphates where even we Jews at one time under one of the caliphates of the Islamic rule of the world had a golden era. We were pretty much, uh, you know, advisors to the court and we were kept for our intelligence, for our science. And a lot of things were developed by the caliphate at that time that ruled the world or ruled a part of the world. You see, the only ones that were actual dictators of ruling the world are listed in Daniel's dream. We know that because you can look at history and see that they actually control the world. People tend to look at Daniel's dream and go, well, what about America? Well, what about America? You see, there's a problem with prophecy when you want to be in it and you're not. The problem is who wrote prophecy and who decides what prophecy is. That reality of who wrote prophecy and who decides is why we're talking about a shadow of things to come. America is a macrocosm uh, or a microcosm of the macrocosmic world of God's will being done in the universe. The world itself that we're in is actually a microcosm of the spiritual realm that God is using to demonstrate to the entire universe what his love is. We aren't the only beings that are alive. We are partial creation. There are plants like the plant kingdom. There are animals like the animal kingdom. There are spirits like the spiritual kingdom. There are us who are, frankly, humanity from the created part of God wanting to fellowship with us 
and have those with which he would commune that we are actually becoming the demonstration of his love towards the universe. Because after all, the angels rebelled. How could they? So there's a certain amount of what we do know and don't know and a certain amount of kingdoms and realities that are going on in creation that are beyond us, that incorporate us, but aren't the actual fulfillment of what God is doing. God wrote this. This is what we mean by this. The Word of God. I don't mean he wrote the Bible. You see, we know that there are a certain number of authors. We say 66, eh, you know, so what? Um, a certain amount of people that God chose and the Protestants claim that they're the only ones that wrote the Bible. And, you know, we started off with the Catholic Bible and then decided that that wasn't right. So we decided to get rid of parts of the Catholic Bible and stick with the Protestant Bible, which is the originally one from being the Textus Receptus, the other from the Textus Alexandricus, and the another from another Textus. Meaning that there were scrolls that were circulating and people were adapting them to what they wanted it to be as opposed to what God said it to be. And the reason why we can say that this book of books, this collection of writings, this historical novel as it were, is infallible isn't because the book is, but because the Spirit of God that dwells within each and every believer who is calling upon the name of the Lord to be saved and has allowed God to live in them has the God part of the Trinity of the Father, Son, and Spirit being in them, which is the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God that causes a person to read words that are written on a piece of paper that become God speaking. How that is transmutated isn't some kind of Catholic, you know, mystical, reactionary teaching about the transmutation of some type of celebration of the Passover where Jesus says, now I'm going to tell you a different meaning and suddenly instead of it being a piece of bread, it becomes the flesh of Christ. Not that kind of transmutation. We're talking about a morphing. We're talking about something that goes beyond the written into a dimensional reality that causes something to occur inside of our soul, inside of our spirit, and in the realm that we cannot see, which is the kingdom of God about us. You see, the reality of what the kingdom of God is, is in a sense, heaven come to earth. You can't see it, you can't know it, but it is proven there are dimensions that are all about us that we operate in and take for granted. You are what's called a three-dimensional being. You operate in a couple other dimensions, fourth dimension and I think fifth dimension, although I think they were a bunch of singers, you know, that, well, anyways, we will go there. That's a joke. But three dimensions, you know, there's height, depth, and then space, I think. And then fourth dimension is time, if I remember right. You know, I could get into all this, you know, if we wanted to just sit and talk about, you know, spatial realities and how many dimensions there are, because I think there's seven, but some people have said 12. So, being that, if you want to know about dimensions, by the way, you can watch Chuck Missler's study on the 24 hours of the Bible, and his first introduction to the Bible discusses just the Jewish sages that, and the Jewish rabbis who had just reading in Genesis came up with the dimensions that are existent that we can't see. The fact is that a dimension could be folded up and we, Einstein proved that time was a dimension and that time was relative to the place and the movement of the circular revolvement of the universe as approaching towards the speed of light and slowing down from the speed of light creates a variable that the time element is. So that time is not constant, but it is changing. That's why God doesn't say in the year 2929, when the world is still blind, there was a song called, you know, in the world in the year 2929 or something like that. And it was a beautiful song, but really God doesn't do time the way we do. He uses words like times and seasons, days and hours. As a matter of fact, he doesn't say Sunday or Monday. He says, you know, you know, six days, seventh day rest. Doesn't say which day, just seventh day beginning God created the heavens and the earth you know on the earth was without void and on the first day did this on the second day did this 
Then suddenly we're given the stars, the moon, the sun, and the sky in order to know why. And it was so that we would have times and seasons, so that we would know how to keep time, how to tell time, how to have a season, how to know the reason for the season, which isn't about Jesus, but it's about Jesus coming again, the soon return of the Son of God as he first manifested himself to us as the Son of Man. So tonight, being a shadow of things that we're looking forward to, we want to know more than just simply kind of an overview and discussion and kind of throwing out a bunch of, you know, prophecy things that you already know or should know, as I've already hopefully tempted you with a taste of what we're doing these four hours of watching to be ready and preparing ourselves for the third, fourth, fifth, well, first, second, or third watch. Because, you see, the night was broken up in Jerusalem by the sages and the rabbis to watch. They figured out that, hey, you know, we need somebody up on the walls to make sure just exactly what time it is. You know, they didn't have clocks. They didn't have watches. The sundial didn't work at night, so it wasn't a night dial. As a matter of fact, you had to kind of keep watch. And so there were things like sand and, you know, sand falling through hourglass you know I mean those are kind of some of the things that have been around other people knew how to tell by the rotation of the stars in the sky there were things that obviously wise men knew and of course no offense when you think of Israel you think stupid probably because you think that somehow the world wasn't as smart as we are today when today we're looking back and thinking how did they do that meaning they were smart as we are without using computers and technology and what we call technocracy, but using a kind of, I want to say not farm community, but I want to say natural way of using things, creating gears out of, instead of steel and aluminum and alloys like iron and ore, creating things like out of wood. I mean, there were wood gears that were made in order to lift things and pulpits and rollers and all kinds of things that they probably could have made a mechanical car out of wood and natural products. Da Vinci wasn't the only one who was running around that was pretty smart. As a matter of fact, the world still of the ancient times fascinates us with what they did and how they did it. So that being a shadow of the technology that was going to come, we think we're smarter when in some ways we're dumber. We can't see and realize, as Jesus said, the signs of the times. We don't know that why we're here is because God placed us here for a purpose in a design that is after his own mind and his own heart. In other words, America wasn't created to have a party America wasn't created as some kind of nation to rule the world. America has never been a part of prophecy because America has never been a ruler of the world. Now, some people think somehow that because America became a superpower, oh, you know, somewhere around the 1800s and started influencing parts of the world, that somehow we should be included. If you've looked at the nations that are included in prophecy, they ruled the world, not influenced the world. America does not rule anything. We don't go out and conquer. We have conquered ourselves in the sense of, yeah, you know, we took over some native lands. You know, we kind of like took over some tribal land. We kind of took over some slavery, brought that in, and then made equal rights, you know, covered all up, take care of the mess. But in reality, we haven't really done what world empires have done. I mean, even England wasn't like quite a world empire, though they're considered part of the Ten Nation Confederacy, sort of. They fulfill a smaller part. But Rome itself, the Roman Empire, definitely ruled the world. The Grecian Greek Empire ruled the world. The Medo-Persians ruled the world. The Babylonian Empire ruled the world. In other words, if the king said die, you died. If the king said destroy that nation, they destroyed that nation. If he said move those people, they moved the people. It was not a question of voting and getting the United Nations to agree and someone to pay for the war. Ah, uh -uh, honey, America don't count for nothing in the 
grand scheme of things, we do not influence the world as a dictator or a ruler. So that's number one of why we're not in prophecy. Number two, we're not old enough. If you look at the ages of these civilizations that ruled the world, they had been around a long time, and some of them even longer because they're still with us. America has barely been in existence about over 200 years. That's in prophecy time, just a couple of generations, three or four generations at the most, and the prophecy from Deuteronomy talks about the sins of the father would be visited unto the generation, to the third and fourth generation. We're still reaping what we sowed back in the 1700s, really. I mean, we got the Puritans still affecting us. We've got the, you know, Pennsylvania colony still affecting us. We've got the slavery, you know, that was going on at that time too, back in the 1700s, still affecting us. We got taxes we were supposed to be getting free from, still affecting us. Matter of fact, I don't think much has changed in 200 years. It's still affecting us. We're not under England's control, but we're still under, quote unquote, representation. I don't know, you know, it looks a little weird and funky to me, but it looks like we gave up the King of England for, dare I say today, the King of Washington, D.C., or someone who's approaching that idea with his own vision of what he wants to do to America. He doesn't want to bring America back to what it is. He wants to make America to what he wants it to be. And that's pretty close to getting into something else that we don't want to talk about. So when we talk about a shadow of things to come, it's kind of like this. Imagine yourself walking down the sidewalk. Matter of fact, before I recorded this, that's what I was doing. I three times today said, you know, I got to get at least an hour recorded and would keep all night long doing certain hours, but you know, I just need to get a handle on what I should be sharing, Lord. And so God said for the first hour, talk about, relate, and explain where America isn't and where America is and where America shall be. And I thought, well, that's pretty easy. And so when I looked down at my shadow, he said, that's what it is. It's a shadow of things to come. Well, then I understood it all. In a shadow of things to come, that's an expression in Hebrew that means it's not the literal, but it's something that is a type or a metaphor or something that is similar but not the actual real. That's kind of what the life you're living is right now. You're not living a real life. You're living a life of, well, can I tell you this? Really, the world is not your home. The things you're dealing with in this physical realm are all corrupted. They've all been cursed. The curse hasn't been lifted yet. Nature is still crying out, crying out to God, saying, until, you know, how long until the revelation of the sons of God be made known? In other words, creation itself is still suffering from the fall back in the garden, literally, still to this day, even after Jesus rising from the dead. Now, eventually, God is going to restore some things. In the millennial kingdom, hey, you know, we're told that there's a lot that's going to change and be made according to the promises that have still yet to be made manifest to us. Some promises we've enjoyed as being part of the God is saving the Gentiles grace age or Gentile age and time of the Gentiles. We are enjoying a certain amount of prosperity from the earth reaping and in some cases, some people say raping, the world for its type of productive uses that can be made in technology, we could probably do it a better way in natural ways that they did in the olden days, but modern days we want things our way, so we create in our own image the world, and up until the great tribulation when God wipes it all out, it's okay in some ways we will reap what we've sown and we will still suffer the consequences of our actions to this world. But this is all passing away. This is a shadow of the things to come. Nothing is exactly what you're going to inherit in eternity. Nothing is going to last that you see around you. None of this is a part of who you are 
though you may think it is because your identity at this time probably is wrapped up into something like your job, how much your wife loves you or your kids adore you or your church you know, manifests itself to helping you or you've got your ego and your super ego in check or you know, your physical body has a certain amount of uh, savoir faire and you look gorgeous, honey, until you get old and then you, you know, kind of wilt and die and draw up and droop and you know, whatever you do before you actually decay in the dust from which you came from and where you return. That's not the reality of who you are. Eternity is who you are. You see, when you were created as a prophecy, literally, it's prophetic, God breathed into you the breath of life. You didn't come out of, you know, some kind of like, hey, let's get some sperm and let's get some egg and bungo, we got life. Bingo, bango, bungo is what I like to say. Uh-uh, honey, I got news for you, you know. The missing part of your marriage is probably God because God never said it's just man and woman, but it's supposed to be whom God hath joined together. Uh, he's got the hands and he's got, you know, like himself inside you. So if you're a Christian and you're a Christian and you got Jesus in you, who else is there if you're coming together? Jesus. So to put it bluntly, you know, in a way you don't want to think about physically, when you're having sex, I'm going to tell you, you're joining yourself to a woman, but you're also in joining God with you. God is in your marriage bed. God is in there in intercourse with you when you're having intercourse. Uh-huh. And that ain't no perversion, baby. It was meant to be holy. What you've done with it, I don't know. If you're like the temple priestesses, you know, where you had to go down in order to get whore in conduct, then maybe you are treating your wife like a whore. I don't know. If you started watching porno and you started doing weird things that the body was not created for, but is to satisfy pleasure, then I got news for you. Ever since the beginning, it's been there. False religion following sensuality and sexuality of a deviant kind in order to gratify personal sexual satisfaction. That's how the children of Israel were stumbled. Hey, the prophet was right. He said to, you know, Balaam said to Balak, you know, well, I can't curse them. I've tried, can't curse them. But I'll tell you what you can do. You know, them, them uh, you know, Jews out there, you know, they're a little conservative. You know, they're like missionary, you know, but guess what? We can send our priestesses and they know all kinds of things that'll twist their whiskers. So let's send them out and mess them up because then they're not serving their God anymore. But they'll go back to the priestesses and, whoa, we'll get from them temple priestesses that are really temple prostitutes what we can't get from our wives does that sound familiar today every prostitute will tell you the fact that the man comes that's married to a prostitute isn't because he can't get sex at home it's because he wants some deviant thing to go on that he can't get his wife to do or worse he turns his wife into a prostitute and the reason I say that is because I want you to know exactly where you're at when it comes to being a son and a daughter of God. Because the shadow of what God wants to do is like the church and the world and you learning in Sunday school and then learning in Bible school and then learning in Bible college and, you know, kind of doing your religious theology thing. But the actual reality of what God wants to do in the sum of the book was to make you one with him. He wanted you to be like Jesus. Jesus said, look, I'm not just saying you can pray to me or you can ask me, but he says, my father loves you. You can pray to the father that God loves you so much. He wants to do this with you and in you and for you and be a part of you. Some of you don't want to have God as a part of you. One of the ways that I first introduced my wife to the concept of the reality of what God is and the reality of what a Christian is, is, hey, God's watching when you're pooping. Man, that freaked her out the first year or two that I told her. <laughs> I have a way of, you know, provoking people into thought life they don't want to have. But then she realized it was okay. Because if God created her that way, then that's natural and normal. God doesn't go, ooh. No, if you know anything about heaven, the eyes are there facing every direction. Everywhere is visible to God. 
He doesn't hide himself, as the scripture says in some places. Read closer and it says, he may hide himself for a season or a moment, but he still sees part of his nature. That's the reality of the creator of the universe. He may separate himself from sin at times and separate himself from the lake of fire eventually and hell when he casts it in there so that nothing of what you as a created being will be able to experience of the creator which will cause you to burn as though in fire because you'll have sensory deprivation of the spirit and the soul well you know i mean god let god deprivation is pretty bad i mean if you want to explore it it gets so horrendous you can't conceive of it because whether you know it or not the mythology of the idea of native culture saying well you know god is in everything isn't right but it isn't wrong a measure or a portion or a type of god is in everything because we're told in romans that even the godhead is revealed in nature that the very nature of God is revealed in creation, and if you looked at it and understand it, you could see that God has revealed himself in his creation. So a part of him, in a sense, not as being worshipped the tree or worshipped the dog or the cat or, you know, the poodle or the chihuahua, but in a sense, when you do something with your hands, an essence of you is a part of that. In the same way that Jesus said, hey, don't you know that if you divorce... You cause the woman to sin because she's still a part of you. She commits adultery. She's still got a part of you in her, part of your soul, a part of your spirit. And then she joins herself to another man and she's adulterous because she has multiple personalities, so to speak, inside, kind of, so to speak, in a metaphorical way. Spiritually, it's a little bit deeper than that, but, you know, we'll just leave it at that for now. The same thing is true of a man. The man doesn't recognize just how much he is participating in that sin. Because Jesus really spoke to the woman about that. The man is in sin. He's committed you know, all kinds of things. Fornication, adultery. Um, his mind went there and God knows if your mind goes there, you're already in sin, Jesus said. So the shadow of these things are to prepare you for eternity. The substance of these things are to be in heaven with God. The actual fulfillment of prophecy is when you are made likened, not as, not like a Mormon thing, but likened unto the Son of God, that you are fit for heaven, living in eternity, extant and existing forever and ever and ever and ever, which is what the definition of eternity is. It's not eternity, meaning just some wild idea that we say, well, you got to kind of have this concept of time. No, the Hebrew is different than most languages because it uses phrases to describe actual realities that exist in the universe. It has an application that is physical. It has an application that is personal. It has an application that is corporate. I mean, there's seven different applications you could apply, and even then, you know, the rabbis say there's 49, but we won't go there too much deeper than that because you're going to get into some Jewish mysticism, you know. And I don't want to go on that end of it because there's just as much Christian mysticism, and I don't want to go on that end of it. I do, at times, talk like a mystic, but I can put it back into perspective of what the reality of God showing us and revealing that Jesus said, if I started to talk of heaven, you couldn't handle it if I'm just now talking about earth and you can't handle that. So God wants to do something more than our shadow existence. Our shadow existence, you know, read your Bible every day. Well, you know, I mean, it's not a bad idea. It's probably going to accomplish something. It's not going to always be what you think it is. I mean, some pastors toss out there, and Romaine was one of them, but he meant it more than just reading. But some pastors throw out there this shadow theology that says, hey, read your Bible every day and God will take you all the way. No. There are people that read their Bible every day and don't remember a word it says or say. Because there's more to reading a Bible than the Bible. Otherwise, this is your God. You can't make reading a Bible the answer it can be a tool that you use to arrive to the destination, 
but it's not the answer in and of itself. Reading has to be accompanied by incorporating, and incorporating has to be encompassing understanding. That's why Jesus used the word see, which means more than see. It means to behold, and that's why he used the word behold, because it means more than to behold and seeing. It means to understand, comprehend, and receive inside of yourself this that you can see. Really? Yeah. Just like the word eternity. It means age to age to age to age to age to age to age. And in the way that it's written, it means that there was no beginning and there's no end. Because it's not time delineated. Otherwise, eternity would mean that you could die at the end of time. Take out time, you're dead. But ages to ages mean that there's a continuing existential existence that goes on continually. In other words, age to age to age to age to age. And that there's always something happening in one of those ages. Otherwise, it wouldn't be called an age. And that's where dispensationalism originally came from, which was taken from a Jewish concept of the whole idea of ages. It wasn't meant to be age delineated and segmented to where it only happens there because God is over all the ages. He created all of it. And the ages wasn't simply a time stamp. Because the ages to ages isn't used as a time differentiation, but it is used as a descriptor and a explanation of the word. Ready? Drum roll. I don't want to do it on a candle. Eternity. So you have eternal life, which you really don't. You have ages to ages to ages life. There you go. And that's why the shadow of what Gentiles know isn't complete unless you add what Jewish people know. And Jewish people are a shadow and type of what Gentiles should know, or what Jews are type of what they need to learn from Gentiles. In other words, Gentiles were supposed to make Jews jealous for their God so that together they would incorporate the fullness of what God is doing in creating us in the first place, which was, put it bluntly, Knowing God and knowing his son. Did you know that? Eternal life is defined by God as knowing him and knowing him who sent Jesus. In other words, knowing Jesus. Knowing Jesus and knowing him who sent him. So, it's not about getting to heaven and, you know, visiting with your family again. Hey, how's it going, man? What's it like up here? A bunch of harps and, you know, uh, baby, uh, d aborted babies that have grown up, you know, and you're going to see your children and you're going to see your grandma and grandpa. Uh-uh. <laughs> it just doesn't. I mean, the whole idea just makes me vomit almost. I, I just get sick. I get ill. I get like, bah! You know, that's humanism. That's some kind of nirvana mixed in with Bible to try to create some kind of Occidental, you know, let's go find the, uh, you know, um, <laughs> Zen of Christianity. I mean, really, I mean, oh boy, we're going to see our loved ones. Let's get written, you know, let's get reincarnated half a dozen times. No, all of the false religions, believe it or not, have one thing, one truth that's taken out of the Bible and deviated and then exploded into complete, um, I like to say it this way, 1% uh, of separation. It's 1% of separation that's been exploded outward through time to be so far from the Bible you don't recognize what the original uh, deviant part was. All of it, believe it or not, comes from Genesis. It's all been here before, it's all been done, it's all been said. There's no new created false religion or thought that hasn't already been tried, done, said, and we Jews have already explained it, expl exploded it, tried it, liked it, and sometimes even went with it and even failed in it. Trust me, the Jewish nation, we Jews, the people, are a shadow of all peoples being saved. God is doing to you what he did to the Jewish nation. The Bible is a shadow of life itself. You are living one of these stories of the Bible. Really, you're living like a Paul or you're living like a Peter. You know. Or you're living like, you know, 
Adam, or you're living like Eve, or you're living like Saul, or you're, you know, lately the people were trying to tell me that, you know, the new President Trump is um, Cyrus, the king, coming in to deliver the nation of Babylonians, you know, and become, you know, uh, some wonderful benefactor to Daniel. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate Pentecostals, you know, but sometimes they really are focused more on the Pentecostal stuff than they are on the God stuff or reality of listening to what Jesus said. They want to read what they got and then explain it in a way that we don't know where they got it from. And so I can't look at a man who comes in and says, you know, all the things that Mr. Trump has said during his campaign and call him Cyrus. I could call him Saul, maybe, you know, of uh, King Saul and, you know, how that worked out in the end. You know, and I just don't know. I mean, and that's just jumping on the bandwagon with warning us about, hey, don't put your stock in trade in a man who hasn't declared himself to be following Jesus. I mean, even Trump has said what he disagrees with Jesus about. I don't disagree with Jesus about anything. I'm sorry. I argued with Jesus at times about what he was saying because I didn't understand it. I could argue it, but it doesn't mean that in the end I didn't um, accept it as being the will of God, the way of God, the manifestation of what God wants for all of us because God said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. Well, I got it. So the shadow of our life is written in the pages of the book of life. That is what we're talking about. Everything is still not the fulfillment. You see, you wake up in the morning, look in the mirror, and you think you're fulfilled because you're looking and seeing this physical form that you can't see the spiritual side of you. You can't see the soulful side of you. There are symptoms of your soul, like when you're happy, the symptom is a smile. I'm happy, 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 happy. Well, you know, sort of, but it's a symptom. It's like disease has symptoms. Your soul has warning signs, symptoms, things that reveal that there is a soul. The spiritual side is more than that. The spiritual part of you has the peace. You know if you got peace. I mean, <laughs> God knows I can, you know, pray for Mr. Trump, you know, and have peace, perfect peace about it, knowing full well that I'm not going to get what I would hope that would be his salvation. If he gets saved, praise the Lord. If he doesn't, I wouldn't be surprised at all. And that's not trying to wish for him damnation. It's just realization of the fact that Jesus said, you know, how hard is it for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven? If the guy wants to give up all his wealth and riches, fine. He hasn't done it, and he's proven he won't. But, you know, is it possible? Sure, it's also possible God can create a rock that he cannot lift, but he'll still be able to lift it because guess what? He can do that, and it makes it possible and probable and makes man the one who's stupid. But anyways, theological-wise, yes. God could save Mr. Trump. To date, he hasn't. To date, Mr. Trump is not saved. So, finding ourselves in that shadow existence of being in a tabernacle of flesh, a tent, as it were, the Jews had a way of calling it that. It wasn't the temple that was built after the things in heaven. It was the tabernacle that was built after the things of heaven. After David got in his mind that, you know, he didn't want things to be temporary. He didn't like the idea of the tent. He wanted it to be Trump Towers. He built an idea of the house of God. And he gave it over to Solomon, his son. A type who could be of, of Trump, you know. I mean, hey, except for Trump doesn't have the wisdom, unfortunately. But Solomon liked gold. He liked women. I mean, you know, and he liked pleasure. So he was investigating all that. Got away with it, too, for a long time until it brought the nation down. But he did build the house of God as David designed it. But David patterned it after something that came from the tabernacle that was come from inspiration of what is in heaven. So the temple of God, the house of God, is a shadow of the fulfillment. The tabernacle is a shadow of what was in heaven. Heaven is where we're going. The new Jerusalem is where we're going. Israel is not the fulfillment of our destiny or of a Jewish destiny. We're going to the new Jerusalem, the mother of us all. 
God's bringing down New Jerusalem and says, see, I told you I'd prepare a place for you. New Jerusalem is that place. It ain't a temple being built in Jerusalem or going to be built partially so that some antichrist could come in and try to declare himself God and God wipes it all out. Or that two prophets could come, prophet being Moses and Elijah, and witness against Israel, against the world, and tell everyone, hey, wake up, Jesus is coming. I imagine that they're going to say something similar to that, but not exactly those words. The Gentiles are not specifically their ministry, but they are sent to the nation of Israel. They are sent to prophesy to the world because of the Antichrist that has deceived the world and the false prophet that has set up the world religion that has deceived the world. So they are all types. They are all shadows of things that are the fulfillment that soon God knows I hope you aren't here to see. I'm told by Jesus I'm the light of the world. I look at this candle you know and I could say well which is real me or the candle do I shine or does it because I got news for you I do glow rarely <laughs> which brings me to a point of something that happened when I got saved when I went to Calvary Chapel Riverside before it became harvest it was a little country church, and everybody knows that, and everybody that was there knew that it was kind of like a little country church, and the song was kind of similar to that, you know, it was dedicated about, you know, Calvary Costa Mesa, but, you know, uh, the old church that Calvary used to sit in, you know, um, in Riverside, that Greg, you know, had night concerts. Um, it was reeling and rocking, but there were people there glowing, and that's what I noticed when I first went. I noticed it wasn't just people were smiling. There was a glow that was like, not as bright as Moses, but it was bright. It, people shined. They had a glow. And you knew that because the people used to think, is that a cult? Now, the cultists didn't have a glow, but they had that kind of blank stare. You know, the smile stare that looks like, you know, um, uh, I can't think of that. All the robots were in that city and they called them Stepford Wise. They had the Stepford look, <laughs> not the Moses look. The Moses look glowed. They had to put a blanket over his face. He was so shiny. You know, and that's not just because he's white either. <laughs> it wasn't that kind of shine. But it was just emanation of the presence of God being inside of him. His spirit was being so bright, so overwhelming. And as it died down, the flesh began to encompass it and cover it up. But when I got saved, I don't know if I glowed. I didn't go home and look in a mirror. But I was told by my wife, my current, I've been married before, so I just want to say my current wife, because I always like to say that to remind people, hey, I, you know, don't think that I'm married to the same woman forever and ever and ever, and that God joined us together in my first marriage. Uh-uh, baby. <laughs> I did it, and it was about sex, and I was already saved, pure and simple. And so it lasted as long as I could try to play God, and guess what? It didn't last. That's what happens with sin. Regardless of what you think about marriage, it's not something that is just an automatic God blesses your efforts in some kind of marriage you put together. Trust me, the marriage I have now, I gave up and God put us together. I quit looking. You know, I started looking and I found this woman and I said, you know, I can't, I very well can't make this decision because it has to be God and you and, you know, I'll go along with what the two of you decide, but, you know, God's already told me you're the one, you know, <laughs> and, you know, that was the way it worked. Bottom line is that God put us together. God joined us together. You know, if we wanted to divorce, and we, you know, talked about that, not to actually go through with it, but yelled at each, you know, like most married couples, we've yelled at each other, you know, adjustment syndrome, because we've been married, both of us have been married before. But, you know, me being the mature one, sort of, you know, I, I'm a good baggage handler, so, you know, I knew that through time we would, God would join us together and make us one, and we asked. And it's a beautiful sight to see as she's grown up in her own relationship with the Lord and become a dynamic woman of God. Why she married me, I have a clue, you know. But anyways, God joined us together. What do you had in mind? Well, I can see some benefits, you know. I mean, it definitely, I needed her and she needed me. You know, so God worked it out. And people that meet us know that. There's no doubt about it. But the one thing that's interesting and the reason I brought that up isn't because of sin or salvation or redemption or restoration, but it's the fact of, when I first stepped out into the ministry after so long a time, 
when I first got back behind, as it were, a pulpit to speak to people, she went to watch and her mouth dropped. She didn't see me anymore. She saw me glow. She saw Jesus. <laughs> I mean, she saw the man that God had created inside of me and that it manifested itself to tell people about who I met. Jesus. She saw a person that few people have ever seen. Oh, they suspect that he's in there somewhere, maybe drowning in the flesh of the Michael outside. As my hands come together and I hold them, you know, I kind of remember my first love and what Jesus did in me. Now, that doesn't mean that now, talking back in my normal fleshy voice, that uh, I'm any less who I am still. It just means that the world is not ready for us as tender as God wants us to be, as sensitized and sensitive and operating, walking in the Spirit as we could be. Because it can't handle that, and neither can we. The world would be saved. The world isn't meant to be. It's corrupted. So even as God had to put an angel blocking the way to the tree of life, lest Adam eat of it and stay forever in sin, God doesn't allow us to always be fully walking in the Spirit, though I can teach on that now and <laughs> very easily talk about it. You know, no problem. You know, a lot of Pentecostals want to go off into some kind of, you know, like, Let's tongue it, you know, and they start babbling in tongues, and I could tell them what they're saying, and they start, you know, whispering or singing or doing whatever they're going to do, and I could tell them what they're doing, and because you know, God used me that way. But that doesn't mean that I'm better or worse. It just means everyone will have all of the Holy Spirit overflowing from them when it's God doing it and not you. So my wife saw that because the shadow of who I am is right in front of you, but the reality of who I'm becoming is still in God's image, yet to be revealed in me as I become likened unto him, eventually as Jesus. Not Jesus, but Jesus of his likeness, overwhelming my soul and becoming shining forth of my spirit that when I get my new flesh, my new physical form that is equipped for the spiritual realm, which would be a spiritual body, then I will be made known as I am known. I hope it's not a mouth. <laughs> but that's why we say the shadow of things. Most of what you're talking about, whenever you're talking about the things you can see, touch, or feel, are shadow images. They're not reality yet. They're not the real. I got a thought that the Lord just drew to my brain that I'll have to pursue some other time, but I'll throw it out there for you if you want to play with some kind of, you know, daisy trail and go off on a tangent, is um, sanctified brings the reality of the physical form into the spiritual realm so that that way that part is kind of communicative to that which is separated unto God for a purpose that he's designed, which is what holiness is defined as. So sanctified things that if he has sanctified them would be such that they would be existential in that other dimensional reality and coexist in both meaning that it is probable that the ark of the covenant of the quote-unquote glow or the the um, she shekinah shekinah glory that we use the word for of the power of god that was manifest there at that time probably was just simply a dimensional reality that sometimes you know flash has nowadays and the comic books have you know this kind of like time shift kind of thing equation where you can get outside of the universe you know and it kind of goes swirly and then you're in another dimension well you know dimensional shift hey you know hey i i got reality for you is that that's what happens spiritually all the time and that's how angels come and go and jacob's ladder is and such and things occur through the dream state so to speak that can become reality but necessarily aren't always of God but something else 
but that it could be visionary of that which is happening in the dimensional reality that is of the spirit and not of the flesh that is not here and now but of that which is there and then which sometimes manifests itself in the area of prophecy did you get all that replay it you'll figure it out but it's you know kind of fun daisy trail to go down you know if you want to go apply it because it, it works i mean just thinking about it you know now i haven't tried to um think about it long enough to prove it false so if until i can prove it false i don't teach it true because if i can't prove it false then and i'm pretty good at proving things false then um i accept it as god telling me something that's like really cool you know to apply to scripture and i get a lot of that just out of the clear blue because god doesn't choose the timing of when he speaks to you, you just kind of go yeah and you go when God speaks, people listen. Not really. But in the still small voice, that's when we ignore. When he comes down on Mount Sinai, you won't ignore. So God is still the same. It's just he chooses to operate in a different way at different times according to the manifestation of the Spirit of God in diverse manners, particulating that with which he wants to reveal to you so that you would no longer be caught up in just the shadow of things but experience the reality of things. That's why people are talking so much now about the presence of instead of the person now i don't want to rain on pentecostal parade but the presence of god is not what they're talking about they're talking about a presence that makes them feel good that should begin to make you a little nervous now god inhabits the praises of his people Jesus said you won't worship on the mountain, you won't worship in the house, you won't worship in the temple, you won't worship in the synagogue, you won't worship in the worship service, but you'll worship in spirit and in truth. So don't think that because you're in a church that says they're doing spirit and truth, that's what Jesus meant. No, he meant anytime, anywhere, any place, as you are, the way you are, in touch with and in connection with God offering up praise. Praise the Lord, there's worship. I'm not well i guess i am in no temple in my own way and we are the temple of the holy spirit so in that respect we are in our own church as we're in our own flesh so you know you got that covered but the reality is is that that's what jesus meant when he's telling him look don't get focused on a worship service with a worship leader and guitars and bands and stringed instruments and drums you know and every number of god only knows what other things you're going to add to to try to create some kind of presence and god's presence was there where did it go when it wasn't did it suddenly go, woo, fly by and come back? No, you had a crowd experience. Sorry, but it's true. A lot of what Christianity is involved in now is crowd experience that rock stars know. And it happens to work well in the worship service. And some people might be experiencing God. Some people might be experiencing the God of this world. I mean, he operates within... You got it. If Judas was there sitting next to Jesus, you got to know that, hey, not everything that's going on inside your church is holy. Sorry. It doesn't quite work that way. I mean, you can go out and pray over every chair, bench, and service, you know, item and stuff, and that'll work. People coming in will be affected, and those that are demonic will be, you know, kind of like not able to be there. But I got news for you. Your church doesn't do that. I do. Every church I've ever worked at when I was the janitor cleaning, I would go and not clean the outside. I would pray for the inside so that if I was cleaning the stool they were going to sit on or the pew or the chair, I would pray that the person that was going to sit there would be felt of and protected by the Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit would work on them. Yeah, that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to take back the land not occupy it like, you know, we know what we're doing. Most of the time, people don't even do that anymore, except for some wackos, you know, and sometimes some Pentecostals. But in the Jesus movement, I thought we were supposed to do that. So I went out, you know, and if it was supposed to go around the, you know, building seven times, I went around the building seven times, you know. Worked in Jericho. Why can't it work anywhere else? Now, as I did that, God added to that, and I experienced more of God. Because the shadow of it was to begin in some way that didn't make much sense, that I didn't understand. And then God would bring the fulfillment of it so that I would understand. And then I'd begin to see more of what really the actuality of it would become. Eventually, I went through 
Klamath Falls circulating, uh, circling it seven times. There was three or four witches covens that were assembling there in Klamath Falls. There was supposed to be another one getting started. And after we got done with that, there weren't any. There was still satanic things going on. There were still witches there. There was still bestiality and all kinds of things happening in Klamath Falls, Oregon. But the covens were gone. Principalities, power, spiritual wickedness, you call it what you want. There you go. God will take you where you want to be of the reality of the shadow of things when he brings the fulfillment of things. But you might not want to know. Those kind of things aren't name it, declaim it, declare it, and you know, command it. You aren't dealing with demons, spiritual warfare, when you're claiming, demanding, professing, confessing, or somehow using the name of Jesus in order to exercise some power you think you have. Satan just falls down, crawls behind you, and stabs you in the back because your pride and ego blinds you to the truth of what you're doing. And that is making yourself out to be God, and you're not. So the shadow of things can be both good in one way and bad in another way when you don't know the way to apply them because the fullness of what we're talking about is Genesis to Revelation. All of prophecy is about Jesus. All of prophecy. Every single prophecy. All of them is about Jesus. God is so thrilled with his son, so happy to have given over to us his son, that he made the universe watch and be still for a moment as Jesus died for all of creation and destroy the works of the devil. Wow. God died. And that's what happened. I got a candle going out, so I'm always fascinated. It's like, is it going to go out? But America is, as we said a little while ago, a shadow of prophecy, not the fulfillment. Russia or God, Magog, and the nations that God calls as them by his name for them, not our name. Three million man army as China has developed one, you know, and by his name, not our name, he defines them by the army they have. Babylon as he defines it by what he calls it, not by what we choose to make it into being. Physical representations that look like animals that are in heaven that represent those things that are occurring on earth as he sees them as the evil that they are, which are just animalistic, not humanistic or huma uh, humanistic, not um, well, animalistic of the kingdoms that are acting like animals and the type of animals that those are that represent them instead of it being the creation of in the image of God being godliness there you go now you know why you see animals it's not just some metaphor that's the way they are I mean eagle think about it that wasn't what Benjamin Franklin wanted to use as a symbol of America no what happened was that a lot of the utopianists at our founding fathers, who were supposed to be Christians, were trying to create a perfect kingdom. They really were. They were trying, some of them. Not all of them. There were, not everyone was a utopianist, but, you know, Jefferson was one, a couple others, you know. But there were some utopianists that wanted to make the perfect society. And it was a common theme throughout that time of the world because they felt like, the world was changing. 1776 was closer coming up to the 1800s. They were looking forward to radical changes. Not the end of the world, but the new world. If anything, America is a type of the new world order. No longer kings, but ten nation confederacies or 
governments of miry clay, which is what America is a shadow of. We're a shadow of the Ten Toes because we're a shadow of the world. Our government is patterned after Rome, not after democracy, not after republic, but after Roman rule. Now, the Caesar is our president. The Senate is our House of Representatives and Senate. The people representation comes from Greek ideal ideology. We are the epitome of what Jews feared called Hellenism, which is what the Hasmonean dynasty began that actually <laughs> modified the temple to create it in such a way that even God's spirit wasn't in the temple when Jesus went there. I'm sorry, you can say it was, it wasn't. Because the spirit of God had left the temple. I'm sorry, but you know what? By the time that the Jews went back to dedicate the temple, the temple was not blessed by God. It was vacant. And it's evident by the silence that God was until an angel spoke to, as we know, one of the priests, not necessarily the high priest. So, hey, shadow of things. America, our government, our beginning, our protest against taxes and creating the same thing. Protestantism, as it protests against Romanism, actually became a protesting of many other things that they protested against and are still subdividing because they started with the seeds of their own protest and they're still protesting as they keep subdividing and subdividing. So the protest is still going on. That's why they're called Protestantism, Protestantism. The words fit. You don't know that, but they do spiritually. Watch what you name your child. It'll become like it. God knows whoever named me Michael made a mistake. I question everything, which worked out for a blessing, but not a curse. And it could go both ways. It was a curse for a long time. It still might be in some ways. People don't like my answers to my questions because I've already asked their questions and I already got the answer. So shadow of things to come is meaning that prophecy isn't about me. It's about he, not us about him so when we get to America no we are a standard in a way of a mirror image of the world to look at all of America from Alaska to Florida to Southern California to Maine and Hawaii of a image shadow of the world whatever's going on in the world is going on in America. Whatever's going on in America is going on in the world. The same way that Israel was a shadow of God's will being done in the world. What is going on in Israel today isn't God's will. Trust me. It's God's promise, but no one in Israel is doing God's will. They're doing their own, and they know it. And they've said it, and they admit it. Even the Orthodox will admit that, no, we're not getting a word from God. We're just doing what God had said last, and we're going to keep going until the Messiah comes. Doing what we think is right, and we'll be judged for it, and they accept that. Bottom line, Orthodoxy. And then you get into the you know, corrupt part of it, and you really don't want to know about that. I had to deal with it. Sadly, it destroys your whole view of Israel, the nation, and the people. Now, there are good people in Israel, and when I lived there, I met them. You know, I mean, they're Messianic Jews. There are sincere Jews. There are Jews who have come from uh, South Africa, from Russia. I mean, I love Belarusians, but anyways, South Africa, from Russia, from around the world. I mean, I met Jews from everywhere, every nation, kindred tongue. And it was wonderful. And I even met people from around the world that weren't Jewish in Israel, in Jerusalem. And it was beautiful, magnificent in some ways, intellectually. Spiritually, Jerusalem is evil. There's a evil that's there. There's a principality that stands there and controls a lot of what goes on in the city of Jerusalem. That's why they're building all those um, settlements around Jerusalem. They want to enclose it and make it a walled city of apartment complexes. By the way, apartments are made out of cliffs and cement and not wood so when you have a walled city you actually have apartments all the way built around Jerusalem you actually have a wall of protection it's one of the 
secondary benefits of doing some <coughs> illegal construction. It's also meant to keep out anyone from coming in. And currently, the administration in Israel wants all non-Jews out of Israel. They want to create a super nation that is only for Jew only. And they have created a reverse discrimination that was the fear of what Zionism would become. And they have done that. Unfortunately, BB and the Orthodox are pushing that heavily. And now the settlers have jumped on the bandwagon and they want to push that even farther to become militant in it. That's where the Antichrist will finally make peace by someone in Israeli leadership selling out the people of Israel. Sadly. I hope it's not Bibi. Looks like it. Doesn't have to happen this soon, but I don't think he'll last longer. I think pretty soon they're going to have a referendum and get him out of office, hopefully. You know, I like the man. I just don't like his politics in Israel. What he does over here is just con game, you know, propaganda. You know, a lot of people do propaganda in America. They get away with it, too, which is amazing, especially if you mention Israel. Ah, oh, send money. You know, okay, yeah, okay, send trees, you know. I mean, I lived in Israel, and I used to watch the money roll in, and I used to send back stories, you know, that made everybody, you know, weep and cry, you know, and think, oh, we got to send the money, you know. Oh, there was a, a terrorist attack in Israel. Who was it? Well, it was this criminal that got out of jail, you know, a couple weeks ago, you know, and he killed one guy. Oh, and that's a terrorist attack? Well, yeah, in Israel it is, of course, you know. Ha. In America, we just think of it as, really? Down the street? Oh, wow. Who cares? In other words, the number of deaths that happen in America are 10 times, 100 times greater and more number than ever happens in Israel. And there are way more deaths every day than happens in terrorist attacks in the world in America. You just don't pay much attention to it anymore because you got inoculated to it. And America is a type of the world. It's a shadow of what's happening in the world, all around the world. There are wars going on in America, really, gang wars. Type of the wars going on in Africa. Seriously, territorial. There are social causes still going on in America. Matter of fact, if you scratch the surface, you find a white supremacist somewhere around. Don't have to go very far now from Washington even to find them. Sorry, true story. Um, equal rights, women's rights, work, ethics, morality, religion, all of it is here in a microcosm of what's going on over there in the world as a macrocosm. Why do you think God shed his grace on thee? Because we are the world type, not the world itself. No, not the um, nation prophesied in the book of Revelation. No, we're not the... <laughs> God, I don't even want to... I don't even know who to pick to make us one of them. You know, I, I can't pick any of them because none of us, none of America fits it. But America fits all of it. Because if you treat us as being a shadow of it, then from Genesis to Revelation we're in. Because that's what we are. We're kind of like a type of the entire world. Now, we're not Babylon, you know, and polluting the world, although that's a type of what we are because in a way we do that. Most of what America does is corrupt the world with, you know, and like the, the Muslims say in Islam and the terrorists overseas, that a radical Islamist, not necessarily Muslim, but... They say, you know, we're corrupting people because of our ethics and our morality and our, you know, our drive throughs and our McDonald's and our cheap way of living and our, you know, loose living and all that stuff. And they're right. They're not wrong. Don't get me wrong. Terrorists are not wrong about what they say about us doing things with the CIA and converting countries and destroying nations. We do that. We bomb the hell out of people and kill innocent victims. We do that. And we call it right. We're wrong. We are the devil as far as they're concerned, and they're right about that as a shadow of what's going to come. Because we make, in some ways, the Antichrist look like a world leader that's going to bring peace. Because he's going to put America back in its place. To get out of behind-the-scenes manipulations. Get out of buying nations and buying people to be in office and buying people to do this and sending people to manipulate that. It's not isolationism. It's going to be universalism, but it's going to come at a heavy price, the end of the world. And it'll be following a false Christ. So, ending this now, the only thing I can tell you is that you got to think it. you got to ask God and sit down and say, hey, you know, this Michael, he didn't you know, give me Bible verses, but he quoted the Bible. He didn't give me you know, chapter and verse, but he quoted chapters and verses. He didn't give me exactly the scriptures, but he 
quoted from Genesis to Revelation about prophecy. He said that this is about that and that's about this. And God, I think it makes sense. So what do you think? See, the reason why I commend you back to your God, and I say your God because he might not be my God. I don't know who you are or what you're doing. I know what I am. I know who I am. I know how I am. And I know who I serve. <laughs> and God knows I need grace. So I know what I need and I know what I do and I know what's coming. So I am serving him with all that I am. I'm not getting more involved in football, basketball, you know, after school activities, IRAs, taking in money, doing this, that, or the other thing, or even getting worse about ministry or less about ministry. No, I'm being sober-minded, diligent. I'm cleaning up my act. I'm standing before you and saying, baby, Jesus is coming sooner than you think, and you don't know that he's right around the corner. As a matter of fact, he's knocking at your door, and he could come at any moment. And if you hear that door knock, you ought to go answer it because he might be taking you away, not in the twinkling of an eye, but that you disappeared before our eyes or the fact that you moved outside of your body, your body dropped dead, you walked over to the door, opened it, you know, and an angel took you to heaven and you got a new body in the air, but your carcass is still on the earth. That could be true too. That is one of the things we'll discuss in the second or third hour that we discuss rapture because that's not all there is to the rapture is poof, snap, bingo, you're gone. Bingo, bango, bongo, gone. Ah, uh -uh, baby. <laughs> Nowhere does it say that instantaneously gone. It says in the twinkling of an eye, we shall be changed. Stepping out of your body would be the same truth of being changed. You're dead is being changed. Frankly, you know, a heart attack is being changed. A lot of things can change in the twinkling of an eye. A lot of people created the zap rapture, you know, the <laughs> rapture zapper, you know, it's like, ah, poof, you know, and because we live in America with magicians and superstitions, it caught on. Will it be that way? We'll talk about that in a couple hours. Now, the shadow of things to come, ask God about. Because the reason why I commended you to God is to ask him is because I don't want you going out and saying, well, Michael said America's in prophecy. Well, it's not. And then I want you to go out and say, Michael said America's not in prophecy. I want you to be able to tell me that America is not prophecy because Jesus said so, God said so. You could tell me you studied the Bible and it says so, and I'd agree with that intellectually. But I want you to be able to stand before the living God and say, I know so because you said so. Yeah, that's what eternal life is about. Being able to stand before the living God about who you know so. You know him. You see him. You aren't terrified at his appearance though we all will be we'll fall down and bend a knee so to speak because falling down is bending a knee and falling flat on your face like most people have done when they go to heaven according to the bible is the reality of those that really did then we probably will too kaboom you know because we're so overwhelmed we're not slain in the spirit we're just like overcome by the spirit so to speak and so when we know that God said he has a promise for us and that people say you can write it, you know, and claim it, or you can, it's a promise, it's a check, write your name on it, or whatever you want to call it. I don't go by that. I think that's bull. I think that's garbage. I think it's phony. But when God says, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who abradeth not, but give it to all men liberally, then I say unto you that ask God. Jesus said, don't think you got to ask me ask your father i'm telling you the reality of hearing god is the fact of just stopping and hearing god it's that simple the fact of getting anything from god is stopping long enough to say god help god show me god tell me and then listening and shut up long enough and wait for the answer it's not a yes no or maybe or wait i mean the stupidity of making God a robot is yes, no, wait. That's a robot. That's not God. God spoke to Abraham. God spoke to Adam. God spoke to Moses. God spoke to unbelievers and God spoke to believers all the way from Genesis to the book of Revelation. Why isn't God speaking to you? Audibly. Don't tell me he quit speaking at the end of the book of Revelation or he quit speaking because you think that 
after Acts, there's no gifts of the Spirit, or that somehow after, you know, letters to seven churches, God went silent like he did to the Jews. The promise is, is that, hey, I will be in you. I will be with you. I will speak to you, telling you to go to the left or to the right. I will whisper in your ear to be still, to go forward, to step back. I will be your God. You will be my people. Jesus said, I and my Father are one. I don't pray for these to be taken out of the world, but I pray that they would be in the world and that they would be as I am with you, Father, and they and me and me and them and them and you. Yeah, one with God. It's not a trinity. It's a unity. And it's not a universalism. It's a oneness in the Hebrew. And that means being Emmanuel, God in us. So if God is in you, why aren't you listening to what he has to say? If God is real, why aren't you asking him for what you want to know? If Jesus is coming, why aren't you acting like it? Dare I say, at the end of this hour, now that we've taken the time to remind you that it's a shadow of the things to come, and America is not a prophecy, but it is a microcosm of the macrocosm of world events, world people, the world that's going to experience what's already happening in America, that you can look at America as kind of a shadow of things to come. And I dare say, look at what we have for president, and now watch the world. Yeah, it's coming. Jesus is coming, hopefully, to take us away before it all be revealed. But the shadow of things to come is sitting in the presidency in 2017. And it's not good. And it's not holy. And it's not righteous. And it's not true. Pray today. Stop tonight. Wait on the Lord. Get ready. Get right. Get real. And listen to what God has to say. Because he hasn't stopped speaking. You stop listening. Or maybe you've never heard. Father, I thank you for this hour that we spent in realizing it's all about you. Jesus, I know that I know that I know that I know that you are coming so soon that I know you are going to take those whom God has chosen for you to be spared. All these things come upon the world. God Almighty, I pray and I ask and I beg and I plead that if it be possible that you leave me and take them, then take them and leave me. For surely, O oh God, if there ever were a people that were prepared for dying for the faith and having to suffer one more time, it's the Jewish nation and the Jewish people. But God, if we have a blessing and not a curse, if we have a capability of sitting before you and standing and bargaining as Moses has done, as Abraham has, then I ask, not if there be any righteous, because there are none, but that by your mercy, by your grace, that if one seeks your face tonight and goes to the place of being alone with you, honor their faith. If one cries out to the living God to save me, Hosanna, save me, God, save them. Spare them that with which is coming upon the world and take them home to be with you. For the rest of us, God, thy will be done. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Hour two is coming up in just a few minutes. Hour three, a couple hours in a few minutes. Hour four, quite a bit of ways. I look forward to it. Do you?